Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Jay Warden and welcome to the first in what I hope to be a long series of episodic reviews beginning with Star Trek The Next Generation. Please be warned there will be many spoilers ahead because I will be commenting on how things are now compared to how they will be later in the series. With that said, on with the show! We begin our epic adventure of the TNG franchise with a glory shot of the new Galaxy Class Enterprise D before seeing a bald figure emerge from the shadows, introducing Captain Jean-Luc Picard, the most British Frenchman you're ever going to meet. Picard is making an entry in his log about their upcoming mission to Farpoint Station, whilst he shows off the engineering and bridge sets to the audience. On the bridge we meet everyone's favourite android, Lieutenant Commander Data, who doesn't understand what snooping means, and then the lovely counsellor Deanna Troy, who will soon begin her career of sensing something and then being really vague and unhelpful about about it. A random red shirt reports something strange on the detector circuit, whatever the fuck that is, and a huge grid from the movie Tron is thrown up in front of the Enterprise, forcing Picard to slam on the brakes. As everyone stares blankly at the view screen, there's a bright flash, and some bloke in 16th century clothing with a really bad wig and a shitty hat appears, telling Picard that they've come too far from Earth and they need to immediately fuck off back home. Picard is like, you what mate? And then asks the guy in the crappy costume to identify himself. He calls himself Q and starts showing off his godlike powers, throwing his Tron grid at the turbo lift doors and then freezing the random and red shirt at the helm. Picard seems a bit annoyed by this, but Q just tells him to fuck off again. Q realises he's wearing the wrong costume and changes into a 20th century military uniform. He quips about having a few good men, and accuses Picard of belonging to a dangerous, savage child race. Picard says, well, yeah, we were dicks back then, but you know, we were starting to do better. Q then changes his outfit again into what looks like a bomb disposal suit and then starts snorting some of the good stuff whilst mocking how much better humanity became. Picard gets snarky, which gives Q an idea about becoming Judge Judy before promising he'll be right back and then vanishes off the bridge. And this is just the first 10 minutes. Picard is advised to run away, so the Enterprise legs it whilst the Tron grid collapses, turns into the Eye of Sauron and gives chase. Despite hitting their top speed, the Eye of Sauron is still gaining on them so Picard orders a yellow alert. But shouldn't you be at red alert right now after everything that's just happened, or at least at yellow alert already? I mean, was no one on- Oh fuck it. It becomes clear though that they can't outrun the Eye of Sauron, so Picard orders someone send a text message to the crew to prepare for an emergency source of separation and tells Worf he'll be in command. Worf doesn't really like this and has to remind everyone that he's a Klingon and how they aren't pussies. Picard isn't impressed, so Worf sulks and just says okay I'll do it. Everyone arrives on the battle bridge and here we meet Chief Miles O'Brien for the first time, though nobody actually knows his name or rank just yet. Yar fires a bunch of torpedoes off before Picard gives the order to separate. Everyone looks really tense and nervous, but then it turns out there wasn't really anything to worry about and the ship separates successfully sending the saucer off to safety like some kind of intergalactic frisbee, whilst the star drive section turns back to confront the Eye of Sauron. Picard orders a full stop and puts on his best come at me bro face, and then the Eye of Sauron arrives and transforms back into the Tron grid, which completely surrounds the ship this time. As the camera starts to shake, there's a flash, and suddenly Picard, Data, Yar, and Troy find themselves in some large smoke-filled room with lots of filthy peasant types laughing and shouting at them. There's some gunfire, and a dude in fancy robes comes in and angrily demands that they all stand up for the honoured judge, so Picard just sits down like the sassy fucker he is. Q then makes a grand entrance on a shaky looking platform wearing yet another weird outfit with a shitty hat. Picard expresses his hopes that this will be a fair trial and we all believe Q when he says yes of course. The robe dude asks Picard to enter his plea but Picard is having none of it and tries to get Data to read him his rights, but is told once again to fuck off. Q then demands they answer to the charge of humanity being a bunch of dicks. He then gives him a tablet to read and Picard briefly peruses the document before handing it back and being ever the sassy fucker says he sees no charges against him. The crowd goes wild and Q is pissed off. He sets the guards on them and demand Picard answers guilty or he'll kill them all. So Picard admits that they're guilty. Kinda. Q is intrigued and wants to know what he means by this. Picard admits that yes, they may have been dicks in the past, but demands Q test him to see if it's still true today. Q loves it and says his current mission to Farpoint will provide an excellent test, so he adjourns the court and transports Picard and company back to the Enterprise. Back on the battle bridge, everyone stands around awkwardly whilst O'Brien sits at the helm as if nothing happened and casually comments that Farpoint sounds rather dull. Next, we meet the first officer, Commander William T. Riker. He doesn't have a beard yet, so that probably means the show isn't going to be very good for a while. He's meeting with the administrator of Farpoint, Groppler Zorn. Riker expresses his amazement at how cool Farpoint is and wants to know the secret, but Zorn just offers him some fruit instead. Riker really wants an apple, but is disappointed to find there isn't one. Until there is. And an entire bowl of them, no less. Zorn acts like it was there the whole time, but Riker isn't convinced. Zorn insists everything's cool, and Riker leaves. However, after he leaves, Zorn starts talking to himself and threatening someone with punishment if they don't stop making magic apples appear. Riker then goes to find the show's most memorable character, Dr. Beverly Crusher, and a popular wonder child son, Wesley Crusher. He tries to explain to Dr. Beverly that there's some weird shit going on, but she's more interested in shopping. She looks at some dull looking curtains and wishes there was more bling on it and starts to patronise Riker for wanting to impress the boss. But then she turns back 
back and the curtains now magically have some gold bling on them. Riker looks smug and says I told you so and Dr. Beverly apologises, before musing that old Jean-Luc might be interested before we get some brief backstory on how she's met Picard before because he was kind enough to bring her dead husband home. Then our final cast member shows up, Lieutenant Geordi Laforge. He reports the Enterprise has arrived but without the frisbee attached and says Picard wants Riker to get on board pronto. Once on board, Picard is all rude and barely acknowledges Riker's presence before instructing Yard to bring him up to speed on what happened earlier. Meanwhile, Data phones in to report that the saucer section has finally arrived. Picard wants to try out Riker's skills so has him perform a manual docking. Everyone, including Data for some reason, looks really nervous about this, but if you ask me, it's O'Brien who should really be shitting himself right now as he's doing the actual piloting. But it turns out there was nothing to worry about, and unlike Humpty Dumpty, the ship is put back together again. Riker looks very pleased with himself, but no one congratulates O'Brien who really did all the hard work. Finally, Picard and Riker can have a proper chat, and Picard starts off by trolling Riker about his routine manoeuvre of a manual docking before going on to quiz him about his history of not letting his captain do what he wants. But Riker holds his ground and explains that if you're going to be a twat, he'll tell you to your face that you're being a twat. Picard then also explains that Starfleet thought it was a good idea to have children on a spaceship that blunders itself into all sorts of incredibly dangerous subspace anomalies every other week, and that he also hates kids. So he wants Riker to keep them away from him. Riker is cool with that and Picard finally welcomes him on board properly. In sickbay, LaForge explains to the audience why he wears a bad cosplay of Cyclops' visor from the X-Men. He was born blind, but his visor helps give him vision superpowers by seeing things in different spectrums beyond normal human vision, except for actually giving him normal vision. Meanwhile, Data is escorting an old Admiral to his shuttlecraft. Who is this old Admiral, you might ask? Well, it's Dr. Leonard McCoy from another Enterprise you may have heard about. He seems pretty sprightly for a 137-year-old, and he tells Data that he has to treat the Enterprise like a lady and that she'll always bring you back home. Though I'm honestly not sure that Data would have a fucking clue what he means by that. With all the crew aboard, it's time to move things along, and as Picard tries to check his voicemail, Q appears on the view screen. Worf wants to shoot him, but Picard doesn't want his massive brand new TV damaged. Q gives them a 24 hour deadline to figure out the Farpoint mystery, or he'll judge them guilty by default before vanishing again. Picard is unfazed and says we'll do things our way, then immediately wastes 11 hours by making another log entry. Picard and Riker have a back and forth about the mystery of Farpoint's construction. Picard doesn't seem convinced though by Riker's reports of magic, but he says he's ready to beam down and have a chat with Zorn. Picard then introduces Riker to Troy. It's clear to us though that these two have fucked each other at some point in the past, and Picard is pleased by this because he thinks it's important for his key officers to know each other's abilities, while Riker just looks a bit horrified that he'll be serving with his ex. We're meeting with Zorn again, and he's not happy that Picard brought Troy along to the meeting because he doesn't want people reading his mind. Picard and Riker try to persuade Zorn to get them to build more stations like Farpoint, or at least loan them some of their best engineers, but Zorn just continues to look shifty and refuses before threatening to give the station to someone else more interested in not asking any awkward questions. Troy starts crying about terrible pain and loneliness and says she senses it coming from somewhere close by. Picard asks Zorn about it, but Zorn just gets angry at all the questions, so Picard leaves. Back on the ship, Riker is looking for data, and here we're introduced to the holodeck, a device that allows you to create replicas of places and people in near perfect detail, and that if it truly existed in the real world, would only really be used for porn. As he enters and marvels at how real it all looks, he finds Data trying to whistle Pop Goes the Weasel. Data explains how badass he is as an android, but that he'd give it all up to be human, leading Riker to give him the nickname of Pinocchio. Riker beams down to Farpoint with an away team and begins his investigation by sending Yar, Troy and LaForge underneath the station whilst he and Data search topside. Team Yar starts exploring some creepy looking tunnels underneath the station. LaForge says it's like nothing he's ever seen before, which is pretty funny for a blind guy to say. So Riker asks Troy to start doing something useful, but she just ends up crying again about pain, loneliness and despair, which generally describes our 21st century life and as always is unable to provide any useful information, even after Riker beams down to console her. Back on the Enterprise, Dr. Beverly and Wesley arrive on the bridge. Picard is obviously upset about this as he still hates kids, but Dr. Beverly does a guilt trip by reminding him about the dead husband incident, so he allows Wesley to take a look around, even letting him sit in his chair. Suddenly there's an alarm, and Picard throws Wesley and Dr. Beverly off the bridge because they're fucking annoying. It seems an unknown ship has just appeared on the sensors, so Picard tells Worf to raise the shield and arm the phasers because that seems like the friendly Starfleet thing to do. We check in quickly with Team Riker where Troy insists she's close to being useful now, but it seems their phones have stopped working, so Riker decides it's time to get the fuck out. The Enterprise continues to try and contact the alien ship when suddenly it starts firing at the planet, causing some trouble for the away team as they exit the creepy tunnels, so Riker sends Yar, Troy and LaForge back to the ship whilst he and Data keep pushing forward. Zorn is screaming into his phone for help, but Picard mutes him and finally reconnects with Riker. 
He explains that the old city is getting proper fucked by the orbital strike, but that Farpoint itself is completely unmolested. So Picard sends him to go and kidnap Zorn to finally get some answers. As Picard orders phasers locked onto the attacking ship, Q suddenly appears on the bridge and immediately starts berating Picard for being a dick. But Picard is having none of it, accuses Q of being the real dick, and orders the Enterprise to move in between the ship and the planet to block its fire. Worf goes to comply, but finds his controls have stopped responding. Riker and Data arrive at Zorn's office a bit worse for wear and find him cowering under his desk begging for the carnage to stop, before he's suddenly beamed away screaming. Q just continues to mock their stupidity whilst Troy starts sensing some enormous satisfaction. Picard though has finally had enough of Q being a twat and tells him to either kill them now or just please fuck off. So, with the Bandy City wrecked, the alien ship unchallenged, and Q freezing the ship's controls, Picard decides this is the perfect time to go and see Dr. Beverly and apologise for being a dick to her and Wesley earlier, even if they were being annoying. Picard's a little embarrassed by this, but sucks it up and properly welcomes her to the ship. Meanwhile, Riker beams aboard the alien ship with Data, Yar, and Troy, and it looks suspiciously like they reused the same creepy tunnel set from earlier. Team Riker seem confused, but then Troy starts feeling angry and hateful, and after some more exploring, eventually leads him to Cropla Zorn, who's being tortured in some sort of energy field. Troy finally provides useful information and realises that the ship itself is the life form that she's been sensing and that Zorn knows why it's here. Riker and Data shoot the energy field and free Zorn, which causes the alien ship to start making all the lights glow and make creepy noises, which scares the shit out of Riker enough that he realises he's on camera. Q once again shows up, this time wearing a Starfleet uniform. He says their time is up and he's completely locked the ship down so nothing can be done, and then sits down in the captain's chair and looks smug. Picard begs Q to bring his people back and that he'll do anything he says, and as if on Q, Team Riker along with Zorn suddenly materialise on the bridge. Picard realises he may have just dropped himself in some seriously dodgy shit, but Riker and Troy quickly come to his defence and explain it was the alien ship that sent them back and not Q, and how the entire ship is a life form. But eventually Picard gets Zorn to give up the game, and we realise that Farpoint Station itself is another life form exactly like the one in orbit. As the alien ship turns into a giant jellyfish, Picard orders an energy beam to be fired at Farpoint to give the alien on the surface some much needed food. Once the Farpoint alien has had its fill, it also turns into a giant jellyfish, rising up from the surface to finally reunite with its made with some really cheesy and shitty looking special effects before flying off into the blackness of space. Q doesn't look particularly happy that Picard and his crew finally solved the puzzle, so with the test now passed, Picard tells him to get the fuck off his ship. Q obliges, but not before promising he might return one day. With humanity saved, the Enterprise prepares to leave orbit. Riker says he hopes their missions won't always be like this, and Picard trolls him by saying he's sure they'll be much more interesting in the future, before sending the Enterprise off to its next adventure. So, Encounter at Farpoint is the pilot episode of TNG, and as pilots go, it really isn't that bad, or certainly not as bad as I remember. But, you know, it's not that great either. It basically does what it needs to do, and establishes the characters and setting for the future adventures of the Enterprise. You have to remember that this episode was made in 1987, and that's over 30 years ago, as of this recording. So I'm going to try and judge it based on the audiences it was made for at the time, and not too much by today's standards. Probably the most striking thing is how it does not fuck about and wastes no time in getting the adventure going. We're introduced to the new ship, which I love by the way, the Enterprise D has always been my favourite Enterprise design. Then we see two of the main sets, we meet Picard, Data, Troy, and then within two minutes we're thrown straight into the thick of things. But after those first ten minutes we start losing some steam and then we get a drawn out chase and separation sequence and you know, it, it's okay for what it is I guess, it serves to establish what the Enterprise is capable of, though this is only one of three times throughout the series that this separation gimmick is ever used again, four if you count the Generations film. The plot itself is a pretty standard mystery of the week fair with a ticking clock element from Q and honestly if Q really wanted to test humanity out I think he could have done a much better job than this because I really didn't care too much for the whole alien jellyfish mystery and the ending with the jellyfish meeting and flying off was far too drawn out with this awful screeching violin music and probably some of the worst special effects in the entire series. The bandy as a race are very generic and we learn fuck all about them. They all wear this kind of drab, shitty clothing, which I suppose does contrast with the apparent high-tech look of Farpoint versus their primitive-looking city. But yeah, I just didn't really care for them. Also, with the exception of Groppla Zorn, they all seem to wear towels on their head, and I honestly wasn't sure if this was meant to be their hair or if it was just some sort of cultural thing they do on their part, but you know, fuck it, I just didn't care. 
As for Q though, he just saves this episode from being really dull and boring and by far is the most energetic and interesting character in the episode. Uh, I just can't imagine anyone but John Delancey in this role. He is delightful as the quintessential godlike jester that was a common trope in the original series or TOS, uh, being arrogant, playful, mocking and insulting, yet still coming across as this very dangerous being from just one moment to the next, and he clearly has a lot of fun with it. The chemistry between him and Picard isn't quite there yet, as it's purely an antagonistic one at this stage, but later episodes will go on to have some great exchanges between these two, which they then try to replicate later on Star Trek Voyager, between him and Captain Janeway, with, you know, limited success in my opinion, but that's a review for another time. The gratuitous Dr. McCoy cameo is its a nice moment I guess, but really only serves as fan service and to connect this version of Trek with the original series, uh, the writers trying to reassure the old fans that this is set in the same universe as the original series and that they haven't forgot where it all came from. What character development we do get is pretty basic, but you know, it's the pilot and it's trying to cram a lot in those first 90 minutes, so what we do get is just enough to establish some generic traits that will bear fruit later in the show. It's very early days of course for the cast members as they tried to figure out their characters so many of the performances are a bit shouty or stilted but I'll give my brief thoughts now on each character as we see them in this episode. So Picard has elements of his thoughtful, articulate approach to things and his scenes with Q's are usually the best uh, but generally he comes across as quite shouty and easily irritable which is going to eventually be toned down as Patrick Stewart settles into the role uh, plus my girlfriend wanted me to point out how fuckable he is. But by far he is the most talented actor on the screen along with John Delancey though it's no surprise given his thespian background. Riker is surprisingly good, coming across as a confident and charming first officer and with that relatively youthful hint of eagerness in his new posting, uh, he gets plenty to do throughout the episode once he's introduced from showing us his skills, his desire to not just be a yes man to Picard and his concern for his crewmates. Though it's really weird watching him without his signature beard and I kept finding that rather distracting. But of course back in 1987 no one actually really knew how much better he would be with a beard. Data is a little strange as he keeps doing a lot of emoting like uh, smiling or looking nervous or worried which is something he does a fair bit in the first season before becoming the more emotionless yet still curious android of later seasons. And also how can he not know what snooping means? I mean yeah I know Picard throws some shade on this by asking this too but I mean by this point in the show's time period Data has been around for some 25 plus years now and in all this time he didn't learn this? It will be a fairly common trait for Data in these early episodes but it does get toned down as it becomes more about the emotional context of something he doesn't understand rather than a particular word he doesn't get. Lieutenant Yar comes across well enough, I suppose, tough, no nonsense, a bit hot headed and perfectly capable of beating the shit out of you if it's required, quintessential security chief basically, uh, and she does try to show some real passion in the courtroom scenes but otherwise isn't given much to do. I mean it's a real shame that Denise Crosby decided she wanted to leave after the first season and pursue a glorious career elsewhere. Oh, well, never mind. LaForge's only thing right now is that he can see things other people can't and is just kind of there, so there's not really much to say about him right now except how clunky the dialogue in sickbay was when he's telling us he's blind and what the visor does. Likewise there really isn't much to say about Worf right now except that he's a Klingon and that's it. It was supposed to show how everything had moved on and the Federation and Klingons had become allies so it's going to take a while before we really learn anything about him or he gets any character development at all except for the fact that he's a Klingon. And this leaves us finally with Troy, Dr. Crusher and Wesley, arguably the three least popular main characters of the show. I mean if there was anyone on this show I never really liked it was Dr. Crusher and this pilot episode does nothing to change my mind about this. Her very first scene comes across as cold, unlikable and self-important. Her later scenes just show her to be a generally annoying character with a monotone voice. I know that they want to establish her history with Picard and the suggestion that she and Picard might fancy each other but I just never found her interesting. It doesn't really help that she's generally never given much to do except heal you from your injuries, a fact which made Gates McFadden leave the show for a season before coming back later on in season 3. Troy is obviously supposed to be the show's sex appeal and interestingly wears an actual Starfleet uniform here, albeit the short skirted version, the design of which won't stick around for long. But this is something that won't happen again until the sixth season. However, other than looking very pretty, all she really does is tell you what she's sensing and is also the only time she really shows any emotion because any other dialogue scenes with her are just super stilted and dull. Uh, the scene where she and Riker meet on the bridge is a notable example as she speaks telepathically to him but it just feels like there's like no chemistry between the two of them at all. 
And as for Wesley, he's surprisingly not that annoying here. In fact, I think Will Wheaton plays him rather well. Okay, sure he's a little bratty, but he sells being a wide-eyed child filled with wonder and excitement and especially when he gets to have a look around on the bridge and I'm really okay with that. He only starts to get obnoxiously annoying when he saves the ship every other week because the adults are too stupid to figure it out themselves, which actually starts in the very next episode. I suppose the only other thing to comment on here is that I'm obviously watching this on the HD remasters which simultaneously make the show look great and also expose how tacky and cheap some of the sets and special effects can be, even though they've redone some of those. But you know what, I don't really care because this was the late 80s and I can forgive them for this. So overall, a reasonably decent if uneven start to the franchise. Next time will be a review of the episode The Naked Now, which is basically a reused plot of the TOS episode The Naked Time because apparently the writers couldn't come up with their own unique ideas. I hope you enjoyed this video, if so please like, subscribe and share. This has been Jay Warden, signing off.